Okay, welcome. Welcome to Digital Signal Processing. If you're not here for Digital Signal Processing, this would be a good time to kind of sneak out of the room and not be too embarrassed. Uh, if you are here, uh, I'm Alan Downey. I teach at Olin College, which is a new college just outside of Boston. It's an engineering school, and our job is to fix engineering education. And one of the ways that I'm working on that is this book series, which is called Think X for All X, that uses Python to teach other stuff. So the premise is, if you know how to program, I can take a lot of material that's usually taught using mathematics, and instead I can use a programming language, which I think is more readable for a lot of people, and it's also executable. So you get to see how the thing works and run it, and then work your way down and figure out how it works. So uh, the one I'm talking about today is Think DSP. I'm going to blast through about a semester's worth of digital signal processing in three hours, which I hope will be really interesting and exciting. I don't expect that everyone's going to completely understand this at a deep level. The intent is that you're going to get a picture of the, you know, what's the big idea, and that you'll be interested enough that you can go learn more about it later, uh, either by reading my book or lots of other good resources. Signal processing, I think, is one of the coolest things that not enough people know about. The ideas, the ideas behind it are really profound, and they change how you see the world and how you hear the world. Because a lot of what our senses do is signal processing in various ways. So understanding this means understanding how you perceive the world. There's also some really nice mathematics there, and the fundamental algorithm, the fast Fourier transform, is just a really cool idea, one of the most important ideas of sort of the 20th century. Problem is, most people, if you didn't do an engineering degree, you probably didn't study this. And even if you did, you probably studied it mathematically and may not remember it particularly well. One of the things that frustrates me a little bit, this is kind of a standard curriculum in signal processing. It's a good quality textbook, but it takes a long time to get to the good stuff because if you're starting with mathematics, the first chapter has to be complex arithmetic. Here's how you add complex numbers. Here's how you multiply complex numbers. Well, we've got Python, and Python has got complex arithmetic, so we can skip over about seven chapters and get right to the good stuff. And that's what we're going to do. So I think there's an opportunity here to make this stuff a lot more fun, a lot easier to get into, partly by using Python, which I mentioned, and partly by using sound, which makes a lot of sense because, what, as I said, what your ear does is a lot like the spectral analysis that we're going to learn about, the Fourier transform. If you get a chance, not now, but some other time, Click that link and get to Vi Hart's video that's called uh, What's Up With Noise? What is Up With Noise? Really nice explanation of this relationship between the signal that goes into your ear and how your brain then perceives that sound. Um, we'll get to a bit of it today. The other nice thing about using Python is with a, an environment like a Jupyter Notebook, you can explore this stuff interactively. And that's the, the idea behind this workshop. I can give you code. You can see the code. You can see the output. You can try it out. And then you can fiddle with it. You can try some different examples. We can do some exercises. And hopefully, it's a good way to learn about this stuff, both effective and kind of fun. As I mentioned, this is all based on ThinkDSP. It's published by O'Reilly. It's also available under a free license. So you can grab it from Green Tea Press. You can download the PDF and uh, see what you think of it. All right. So I'm going to start at the end, and we're going to work our way backward. This is an example from chapter 10 that shows off where we're headed, and then we'll figure out how to get there. If you saw the email I sent for the tutorial, I advised you to bring headphones if you possibly can, partly because almost every example that we're going to do makes noise, and if everybody's making noise at the same time, it's going to be chaotic. But if you jump into Jupiter, and let me close this up. I was demonstrating this earlier, but let me back up and run it again, just in case people didn't see that. 
So I've got a Jupyter server running. I'm going to shut that down. Jump back into my top level directory. So if you downloaded my repository, you should have a directory called thinkdsp. If you cd into that directory and then launch Jupyter, it'll either launch a browser for you or it'll open up a tab if you already have a browser running. And now you've got a Jupyter server running on your laptop and you also have a browser that's talking to that server. So this is the browser view and you can navigate through your file system in order to find this directory and eventually get to the code directory and get to chapter 10 preview. Chapter 10 preview.ipynb. IPynb is the suffix for a Jupyter notebook because it used to be the IPython notebook. So the name changed, but the suffix hasn't caught up. And if you run the first cell, if it doesn't complain about anything, that means you have all the packages installed that we're going to need. If it does, you might have to install something. And uh, let me know if you know what you're doing, go ahead. And if you don't, I'll come around in a minute and help you out. If everything's working, then work your way through this example and we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. <laughs> 
Okay. How many people have had a chance to work through the notebook and been able to run that last example? Anybody not yet able to run that last example? Okay. Still working on some issues. That's fine. We'll get there. The fundamental thing that this is showing is that I can take a signal that's recorded in one room. So this is an example from freesound.org, which is where I got a bunch of WAV files under free licenses, which made them very nice to work with. So this is what the original recording sounds like. Well, we used to have audio working. Well, let me pause for a minute while we get audio going. This was working during setup, but not now. All right, we'll continue to work on that. Let me talk a little bit about the next couple of sections here, and then when we get to the next notebook, we'll, we'll keep working on that, see if we can get it working. So, that example, when you hear it, sounds like, okay, I took a recording from, from one room and I simulated what it would sound like in a different room. When you hear it, you get a sense of, oh, okay, that's probably a big room. It sounds like a big echoey room. Um, and our ear has a kind of a good sense of acoustics like that. We can tell what a room is like. How we did that using signal processing at this point should not make sense yet. It is pretty much black magic. By the time we're done today, hopefully it's not black magic, the things you need to understand are the Fourier transform, convolution theorem, and LTI theory, linear time invariant theory. And those are the three things we're going to work on today. Again, maybe not in a super deep way, but hopefully you'll leave understanding how these three pieces explain that example that you just saw and heard. Next thing I want to introduce is the module that um, is in ThinkDSP and that we'll use for the, for the workshop. There are three classes that you need to understand here. Uh, one of them is a signal class that represents uh, anything that varies in time. Now, when we're thinking about sound, it's the amplitude of a, of a pressure wave in air. That's what sound is. Uh, that's varying over time and represented, in this case, by a continuous mathematical function. A wave is what you get if you take a continuous signal and you sample it at a discrete sequence, usually equally spaced points, then you get a wave. And we're going to go back and forth between a wave and its spectrum. The spectrum is the Fourier transform of the wave. If you don't know what that is, you will in just a second. Here's the relationship. These are all the classes we're going to use today. So given a signal, which is continuous, I can sample it and get a wave. So the wave is a discrete sequence of samples. Given a wave, I can compute its spectrum. And given a spectrum, I can go back and compute the corresponding wave. We'll also, in a couple of minutes, get to the other piece up there, which is the spectrogram. Uh, but this is it. These are the only classes we're going to use today. So if you jump back into the notebook, uh, chapter 1.ipynb introduces those classes. Uh, read through the text, run the code, and start in on exercise one. And I will both come around and help you out with stuff and also work on being able to play some of the examples. <laughs> 
plugging it back in turned out to be what we needed. If you're working on the exercise and you're making good progress, you can ignore me. If you're stuck, I'll put a solution up here and you can follow along, and then I'll go over it in just a minute. So the idea here is that I've created two signals, a cosine and a sine, that have different frequencies and different amplitudes, and I've added them together. And when you plot that wave, you can kind of see, okay, yeah, there's a high frequency thing there, which is the, the extra wiggles, and the low frequency there, which is the outline of that wave. If you plot the whole wave, you can't really see very much because it's way too many periods of the wave. To compute the spectrum, well, I've got a method that's called make spectrum. I'm gonna unwrap that in a minute and I'll show you how it does what it does. But for now, it's magic. It just takes a wave, computes the corresponding spectrum. And what you see is that it shows you, oh, that's, that wave contains two frequency components. I've got one spike that's at 440 hertz, another spike that's at 880 hertz. And the heights of those lines are the amplitudes of those two frequency components. So if you want to play around with this a little bit, you can try to trick the Fourier transform by adding in more frequency components. So if you make a copy of that and make another signal, and let's make it at, I don't know, 1500 hertz, and I'll give it an amplitude of 0.75. Make this up, anything that you want, and I'm gonna call it signal three and I'm gonna add up all three signals. So when I look at this wave as a function of time, I expect to see some high frequency wiggles because 1500 hertz is now a higher frequency than what I had before and sure enough, I'm seeing some finer looking squiggles than what I had before. And now if I plot the spectrum, I expect to see not two but three spikes because I now have a signal with three frequency components in it. And that's it. That's the fundamental idea of what a spectrum is, which is if you've got a signal that is the sum of a bunch of frequency components, the spectrum will show you for each component what the amplitude of that component is. So if you add things up in the time domain, you can see one spike per frequency component in the frequency domain. And that's the fundamental idea. That's what spectral analysis is. What it says is that any signal can be represented as the sum of components where each component just has one frequency in it. And what the spectrum is, is the list of components and the amplitude of each of those components. The other part of what we kind of saw, it was hidden from you, is the discrete Fourier transform. And that is how you get from a wave to its spectrum. That's what the discrete Fourier transform is. The fast Fourier transform, the FFT, that you've probably heard of, is a fast algorithm for computing the DFT. So these are two related things. The DFT is the transform itself. The FFT is an algorithm for computing that transform. But they're so closely related that people use the two terms interchangeably, so I'll forgive you if you do that. Next thing I want to do is explain how that works, because we've been using this ThinkDSP library, which is a wrapper for basically NumPy and SciPy. So NumPy has a module that's called FFT that provides a bunch of functions. One of them is RFFT, which stands for real FFT, as contrasted with the complex Fourier transform. 
In this case, what we are computing the spectrum of is a signal that we measured. It's a thing that we measured in the real world. Things that you measure in the real world have real quantities. It's really hard to measure anything in the real world and get a complex number. So because we're working with sound, it's always real valued, and so we're going to use the RFFT. And here's what it looks like. If you open up th uh, thinkdsp.py, you'll find a class that's called wave that defines a function or a method called make spectrum. And what make spectrum does is it calls RFFT to compute the Fourier transform. That's how we get the amplitude of each frequency component. And then it calls RFFT frequency, which computes the x-axis. It tells us what the range of frequencies is that those amplitudes correspond to. And what this object does is then take those two pieces of information, the frequencies, which are the f's, and the amplitudes, which, which are the h's, and just puts them together into an object, um, which makes sense from the point of view of data encapsulation. Those two arrays, they're both NumPy arrays, are, are, they contain the two pieces of information we want for a spectrum. So I'm just going to put them together to a spectrum object. The DFT itself, the way it works, I, I like to think of it as a whole bunch of correlations. So if you know that your signal is made up of lots of different frequency components, you can find the amplitude for each one by just constructing a sine wave at each frequency. So this is four different frequencies. The highest frequency is the most squiggly line, and then it gets smoother and smoother. The top one there is zero frequency. Zero frequency means it doesn't vary in time, so it's a constant. And now what I can compute is the correlation of my signal with each of those sinusoids. And if my signal contains a strong component at a given frequency, then that correlation will be high. And if I don't have any energy at that frequency, then the correlation will be low. And that's what you see in the right-hand column there, is a spike at each frequency where the height of that spike is proportional to the amplitude or energy. It can be either one. Uh, the energy that's in that frequency component. So let me pause there for a second. That's kind of a blast through discrete Fourier transform. Questions, thoughts, how much sense is this making? OK, so far. All right. The next thing that's in the notebook is this idea of filtering. And this is the idea of taking a signal and taking each of its frequency components and either amplifying or attenuating different components by different amounts. The example that's in the notebook is a low pass filter. What low pass means is that I'm going to take the low frequency components, I'm going to allow them to pass relatively unchanged. I'm going to take my high frequency components, I'm going to attenuate them, meaning turn down the volume. And if you had a chance to run the example, you heard what a low pass filter sounds like. It takes all the high frequency components from a signal and mutes them. And what it sounds like is the sound that you hear whenever sound has gone through soft, fluffy things. Because everything that's soft and fluffy is basically a low pass filter. So if you hear sound through water or through a pillow or through a wall, it sounds like it's gone through a low pass filter. It also kind of sounds like old telephone service, which is also a low pass filter. Uh, on standard telephone lines, just about everything above 3,000 hertz doesn't get through. And so if you ever heard a voice live and then heard the same voice over a phone, that's what that difference is. The high frequency components are gone. This was, I have a couple of slides in the notes to talk about custom libraries and a couple of thoughts. I'm going to skip over that because it's not important for where we are right now. But I do want to show one example from the notebook, which is this interaction. So hopefully, if Jupiter is behaving for you, you should be able to adjust those sliders and hear different sounds depending on the settings. So this is the original signal 
with a cutoff, a, high, a, a, a low pass filter that cuts off at 5,000 hertz. So everything from 5,000 on up has been removed, and let's see if we're able to play it. That kind of sounds like it's gone through an old uh, phonograph or an old sound system that's not very good. If you turn the cutoff down to 3000, what you're simulating is a telephone line. So here's what that recording would sound like if you played it over a telephone. And you can hear that it's sounding more muffled, more muted than it did before. And here's what it would sound like if you played it through a pillow. So it's getting to the point where you can only hear the bass part and all of the high frequency components are gone. And maybe if you hear it through a wall, it might cut off at 700 or so. Um, or maybe that sounds like water, just to me. And what's the lowest this will go down to? What happens if we cut it off at 100? <laughs> Not much left. So I think all that was left there was a little bit of noise at some 100 hertz or so. Good. All right. So the intent of that example is at this point, you've got some idea of what it means to take a signal and apply a filter to it. In this case, it's a low pass filter. And you've got some intuition for what effect that has on the signal. If you look at the waveform, it gets smoother and smoother. If you look at the spectrum, all the high frequency components are gone. And if you hear what it sounds like, it sounds like it's increasingly muffled, like it's underwater. That's it for the chapter one notebook. If you want to dive into chapter two, start that up, read the text, run the code, and uh, just do the first section, the section that's called waveforms and harmonics. Again, I'll come around and help you out and answer questions, and we'll get started again in a few minutes.
All right, if you're working on the chapter two notebook, the first section is about uh, different waveforms and what their spectrums look like. And there's kind of a pattern here that I wanted to show you and then pose a little bit of a puzzle. So two things you notice, if you look at the square, that's the top left, and the sawtooth is the top right, and the triangle wave, there's uh, two patterns that you see in how quickly the harmonics drop off. So the square wave has a lot of high frequency components. So even when you get up to many multiples of the fundamental frequency, there's still a lot of energy there. And you can see that partly in the wave, that it has lots of sharp corners. And sharp corners in a wave correspond to high frequency components in the spectrum. The triangle, well, it still has a pointy bit, but it's a smoother function. It doesn't have any discontinuities. And even when it makes that corner, it's a sharp corner, but it's not, from a mathematical point of view, not as sharp. And as a result, it doesn't have as many high frequency components. Well, both. So it's discontinuities, what I'm calling a, a jump or discontinuity in the sine wave, that's a really high frequency component. The other one, when it comes to a sharp corner, that's a discontinuity in the derivative, which is also a discontinuity, but it's not as high frequency. The other pattern that you see is that some of these waveforms only contain odd multiples of the fundamental tone and some of them contain all of the integer multiples. So the left there says odd harmonics only, and the right says it has both even and odd harmonics. So in some sense, we've now discovered three out of the four quadrants in this graph, and the natural thing that you might wonder is, is there a waveform, kind of a simple waveform like these other ones, that has a fast drop-off, meaning not super high frequency components, but it contains all the harmonics, not just the odds, but also the evens. So I wanted to pose that puzzle. I'm not going to answer it yet, but if you want to know the answer, if you look at the chapter two solution notebook, you can look there. So do that if you want to, if you've got a little bit of extra time. The other thing I'd like you to do is get back into the notebook and read the next section, which is called aliasing.
Okay, let me interrupt you for a second just to talk about this section a little bit. Um, so what aliasing is, is kind of the error that you get when you take something that's actually continuous. The signal is a continuous function in math world, which means it's kind of an idealization. Nothing in the real world is like that. When we look at a wave, what we've done is taken a discrete set of samples from something that's continuous, which means that we've lost some information. And in particular, we can't always tell what frequency the thing was. The example that's in the notebook has two different fundamental signals, two sinusoids. One of them is at 4,500 hertz. The other one is at 5,500 hertz. And if we sample them at this particular frequency, the frame rate is 10,000 samples per second. When you sample at 10,000 hertz, or uh, 10 kilohertz, the highest frequency component that you can accurately identify is half of that. So if you sample at 10,000, the highest frequency you can identify is 5,000. Everything over 5,000 gets aliased, which means that it seems as if it is at a lower frequency. And that's what this graph is intended to show. The gray line there is the actual continuous signal. And in reality, in the real world, the first one is 4,500 hertz and the second one is 5,500 hertz. But if you sample them at discrete points, and these, these points are every tenth of a millisecond, you'll notice that the samples in both cases are exactly the same. So if I take away the gray lines, if you don't see what the gray lines are and you only see the samples, there is at that point no way to know which of those two signals the samples came from. The 5500 and the 4500 appear to be exactly the same as far as we can tell by looking at samples. And that's what aliasing is. I mentioned a second ago this folding frequency or Nyquist frequency, which is the highest frequency that you can identify based on samples, and it's half of the sampling rate. Uh, and that's a nice derivation of why that's the case that I'm not gonna show you. I'm just gonna assert that that's true. The reason it's called the folding frequency is that everything that's above in this, it, I'll, I'll use 5,000 as my example. Everything that's above 5,000 is gonna get folded back into the range from zero to 5,000. So 5,500 gets folded over and becomes 4,500 or it appears to be 4,500. 6,000 would get folded over and it would appear to be 4,000. Okay, you can start to think about what that pattern looks like. So 7,000 gets folded over. 7,000 is 2,000 in excess of my folding frequency. So it's gonna get wrapped over to 2,000 below my folding. So 7,000 goes down to 3,000. Eight folds to two. Nine folds to one. Where do you think 10 folds to? Zero, which ends up looking like a flat line. So I actually can't distinguish between adding a 10,000 hertz signal or adding an offset where it just shifts the signal up or down a little bit. Once I'm looking at discrete samples, I can't tell the difference. Now, let's see, if 10,000 wraps down to zero, where do you think 11,000 goes? 11 has to go down to negative one, or negative 1,000, I'm doing everything in kilohertz. Goes, so 11 kilohertz goes down to negative one kilohertz. Negative one kilohertz folds back again into the positive zone and becomes positive one kilohertz, and so on. It keeps on folding, so it gets wrapped back and forth and back and forth until it lands in that range. One of the ways that you can see this happening is by looking at a harmonic series, like the signals that we've been looking at, and you can see that all the high frequency components, if they exceed the folding threshold, get wrapped back in and seem as if they are lower frequencies. And if you go back to the notebook, all the way to the bottom, if I remember right, there is an interaction here that you can play around with where you can take a signal, 
a, let me remember what this is. I think it's a square wave. It is a sawtooth. Take a sawtooth at a given frequency, in this case it's 100, and then sample it at a different frame rate. So let's see what happens if I crank this up, the frequency up to 1,000. Okay. That kind of looks okay. So if the actual signal is 1,000, then it's got harmonics at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000. That's what we're seeing there. It's being sampled at 10 kilohertz, so the cutoff is 5 kilohertz, and that's what you're seeing there. What happened to the 6,000? 6,000 appears like it's 4,000, so it gets added in to the 4,000 component, and so on. So this doesn't look too bad because all of my aliased components overlap with the actual harmonics that are in the signal. And so if you listen to it, it doesn't sound like we've messed it up too much. It kind of sounds like a sawtooth at 1,000 hertz. So that's all right. But what if it was 1,100 hertz? Now, all of those aliased harmonics are falling in between the actual harmonics. So they're adding frequency components that are not actually in the signal, but appear in the wave because of the sampling process. And you're going to hear this, which is that this is going to sound like it's much more messed up than the original. Part of the reason that that's such an unpleasant noise is that it contains a bunch of frequency components that are not harmonics. They are not multiples of the fundamental tone. Instead, they are just random aliased tones that, in some sense, aren't supposed to be there. So take a couple of minutes, play around with that interaction, and see how these two things interact. See how the actual signal interacts with the sampling rate to produce aliasing and hear what that sounds like. All right, in the schedule for the tutorials, we're supposed to take one longer break in the middle. I'm going to suggest that we take two somewhat shorter breaks, just because I think it's nice to do. It's kind of a long time to go. So we're at about one hour in. Let's take our first break here. If you want to keep playing with this notebook, you can. Stretch out, get a, get a drink, relax your brain. We'll come back in 10 minutes, which is at 2.35.
Okay, welcome back. I have tea now, so I'm all happy and hopefully my voice will be okay for the rest of the tutorial. So this is the function we looked at a little bit before. We started out using these wave objects and these spectrum objects. We went down one level and I said, okay, this is all based on the RFFT, the real FFT. I wanna go one more level down because I've been lying to you a little bit about these amplitudes. I've been showing you on the spectrum that the height of that line corresponds to how loud that frequency component is. What I didn't tell you is that it's actually a complex number. And it actually represents two pieces of information. So those H's, the result that you get back from RFFT is an array of complex numbers. And the F's, the frequencies, the, the, those are just plain old real numbers, but the H's are complex numbers that encode two pieces of information, which are the offset, the, the, the magnitude, how loud the thing is, and the offset, which is where in the cycle that sinusoid begins. So just to remind you, I'm going to assume that many of you have seen complex numbers before. The usual way you, you think about complex numbers is that there's a real component and an imaginary component. And if you plot them on an xy plane where x is the real axis and y is the imaginary axis, then you can think of any complex number as being a point on this plane. In the context of signal processing, we almost never care about the real part and the imaginary part because those have no physical interpretation. But another way to think about what a complex number is, is it's an angle and a magnitude. And the magnitude is the length of that blue line. If you think of it as a vector, it's the, the magnitude of the vector. That length corresponds to the loudness of the sound. The angle is called the phase offset, and it tells you where in the cycle that sound started, which is this picture here. That value phi is telling you how much this signal is being shifted to the left or to the right. Okay? So the amplitude is loudness, and the phase is where in the cycle we started. But when we plot the spectrum, we only ever plot the amplitude we hardly ever care about phase. And part of that is because of how we perceive sound, which is we really care about loudness. That's a big part of what our ears detect. We don't care as much about phase. But this is a question that I was wondering about, which is I wonder, do we detect phase at all, or are we completely oblivious to it? And this is what the next part of the notebook is meant to explore a little bit. So if you jump back into chapter two, we skipped over this, so you're gonna skip back to the section called amplitude and phase and run through that and think a little bit about what you're seeing. 
Okay, let me show you a couple things in this example. So the idea, I start out with a sawtooth, and at this point, if we compute the spectrum of a sawtooth, we're not too surprised. Again, that's the amplitude of each component. And if I plot the phase of each component, I basically get a big mess. Uh, and the range here, these are in radians. So you can think of these as being angles on a circle from 0 to 365 degrees. Or in radians, it's from 0 to 2 pi. Or if you prefer, it's from negative pi to positive pi. So that's why the vertical axis there is from roughly negative 3 to positive 3, because pi is about 3. In this plot, we don't really learn anything about the phase. There actually is some mathematical structure there. You could uh, take a sawtooth, figure out what the components are of phase. There's some structure that we're not seeing because of, of numerical computation. But you might wonder, OK, so what does phase sound like? One way to figure that out is to take the signal, split it up into its amplitudes and its phases. We're going to keep the amplitudes. We're going to leave those unchanged. And I'm just going to take all the phases and I'm going to randomly shuffle them. So if anything is going to mess up a sound, it would be to shuffle. If I, if I shuffle the amplitudes, this sound would totally sound different. In fact, maybe I'll do that example in just a second. If I shuffle the phases, it's going to change the waveform quite a lot. So I shuffle the phases. And then this, this code right here is taking the, the amplitudes which I have not changed and the phases which I have shuffled and packing them back into a spectrum. I can then take that spectrum and do the inverse Fourier transform to get the corresponding wave. That's what's going on here. And what I see is that my sawtooth, which used to look like this, now looks like this. It is a totally different looking wave. And yet, when I play these two waves, they sound pretty much the same. To my ear, almost the same. The modified one might be just a tiny bit muffled. Might sound like it's been through a low pass filter, but not, you know, not very strictly cut off. I'm not sure. So they're not exactly the same, but they are really similar, despite the fact that they look wildly different. And you can imagine that there might be some alien species that has a totally different way of processing sound from the way that we do. Like if they do it visually by looking at waveforms, and you could almost imagine that that could be the case. You could design like an eye that would take sound and turn it into something physical that moves and sweep it across a visual field. You could, I could design a sensor that would show you what sound looks like. And that alien species would hear these two sounds and they would sound totally different because these two waveforms look totally different. And we would be here with our frequency-based hearing saying, nah, those sound about the same to me, maybe just a tiny bit different. And the aliens would look at us like we had no senses at all. Um, so that one has always struck me as peculiar, that we seem to have sensors that only care about amplitude and don't care about phase. If you're curious about this, you can poke around at it a little bit. Um, there's another notebook that's in this repository that's called phase.ipynb, which is just me as a total amateur playing around with this. People who do psychoacoustics know much more about this, and I don't want to pretend like I'm an expert on this topic. It's just something that I found interesting and played around with. So hopefully we'll find out more. Yes, question. Oh, interesting. The question is whether phase is important in stereo sound and whether we're using it in order to do location of where a sound comes from. Yes, there's definitely some stuff that happens there. If you have sound coming from two sources, they interfere with each other in ways that depend on the phase. Uh, and I think our hearing does use that information. 
These examples are all monophone. I'm not, you know, nothing is stereo, so it's possible that I'm sort of missing it because I'm not doing it in stereo. Uh, good question. Thank you. Yes, the, the question is in wireless data transmission, the phase is absolutely critical because, yeah, you're packing information into both the phase and amplitude part. Yes, but I suspect that if we listened to wireless transmissions, we wouldn't tell the difference. Although they tend to be at higher frequencies than we can hear. Good, thank you both. Good questions. Next section is about chirps. So far, everything that we've done has been a signal that basically has a set of frequency components that don't vary over time. In, in musical terms, it's a note that's just a constant pitch. It's not a note that goes up or down in pitch. That's what a chirp is. Uh, chirp, in this example, we're going to be working with linearly increasing or decreasing frequency. And if you want to jump into the chapter three notebook, uh, read the first section there, which introduces this new chirp object. Skip over leakage for now. We're not going to talk about that today. And then get to the third section, which is about the spectrogram.
if you get to this part of the notebook, that figure there is what I call the Tower of Sauron, because it kind of looks like it. This is showing you one of the limits of just looking at a spectrum, which is that a spectrum is a holistic view of the entire signal at once. The spectrum doesn't really know how things are changing over time. So this example is saying that the chirp has frequency components that start at around 200, they end at about 400, but I can't tell from looking at this figure whether that was a chirp that went up over time, went down, went up and then down. That information is not encoded in the spectrum. What you're seeing there is in some sense motion blur, which is that the, the signal, the component that makes up this signal went from 200 to 400, but I don't know how. And that's what the spectrogram does for you, what it computes is called a short time Fourier transform. The short time means that you're taking your long signal, breaking it up into a bunch of little chunks, and computing the Fourier transform of each chunk. And then the way it's usually plotted, and this is by convention, I've got time on the x-axis. So each column in this diagram is one slice of time. In this case, it's one second. I've broken it up into about 50 pieces. So each piece is about 20 milliseconds. The vertical axis is frequency. So that's my usual range from zero to whatever my highest frequency is. In this case, I cut it off at 700 just because that's the interesting part. I didn't care about any of the higher frequency components. And the darkness of each cell is how much energy there is. So that darkness is like the height of the spectrum that we were looking at. This figure now tells me not only the components that make up my signal, but also how those components are changing over the course of the signal. It starts out at about 220, and it goes up to about 440, and it goes up linearly. And I can see all of that information in the spectrogram, a uh, spectrograph that I couldn't see in the spectrum itself. That makes sense? Any questions about that? All right, yeah. Yes, they are. So this is, I, uh, what, I'm trying to remember which one I meant to say. I meant to say spectrogram. The other thing that you'll see from the notebook is that I can choose how much time to, chunk, to break these chunks up into. And if I have more time, if I have a bigger chunk of time, then I see more of the signal. I have more samples and I have more information. And I can use that information to get a more precise estimate of the frequencies. So if you compare this example, this is medium-sized chunks, if you like. This one has bigger chunks, which means more time, which means I have a longer horizontal chunk, but a finer vertical chunk, because I can see the frequencies more clearly. The flip side is if I break it up into lots of little tiny periods of time, then I can see time with more precision, but I'm losing information about the frequencies in each of those chunks. And that's a trade-off. It's a trade-off you can't escape from. It's called the Gabor limit. And what it says is that you have a finite amount of information to work with, and you can either spend that information getting more precision in time, or you can have more precision in frequency, but you can't have both. And graphically, the way that works out is that each of these little cells is the width that corresponds to my time precision and a height that corresponds to my frequency precision. So the area of those little rectangles is a constant. I can have it be tall and thin or wide and fat, wide and short, but I can't have both. So that's what that is intended to show. And if you have a chance to play around with this, 
You can see what happens as you vary the start frequency and the end frequency. Again, if you're just looking at the spectrum, you can't tell whether it's going up, down, or stays the same, but if you look at the spectrogram, you can. One other thing I wanted to show you, so the, the chirp that we have so far is based on a sinusoid. If you look here, this is the 220 sinusoid, which is at the beginning of the chirp. This is the 440 sinusoid, which is at the end of the chirp. But I can make chirps out of anything. I can take any waveform and make a chirp out of it. And the one that I played around with a little bit is the sawtooth chirp, which is one of the exercises. We're not going to do that exercise now, but if you load up the chapter three solution, you can hear what that sounds like. So I've skipped the first exercise. The second exercise says we're going to write a sawtooth chirp that inherits from chirp and it computes a sawtooth. And here's what the spectrogram looks like. And you can see that it's got a fundamental frequency that's going up linearly and all of its harmonics are going up linearly. So that's why it looks like that fan is expanding. And possibly on your screen, but not up here, you might be able to see what happens when those high frequency components hit the top of the spectrogram. The top of the spectrogram is the cutoff frequency. So play around with that a little bit and then listen to the sawtooth chirp and I'll, I'll come back in just a minute. If you like, you can do what I just did, which is I turned the frame rate down from 10,000 to 4,000. So that has the effect of lowering the folding frequency down to 2,000. I also changed the length of the spectrogram in time, or actually number of samples. I turned it down to 256 samples. And now you can see the frequency components a little bit more clearly. And you can see that when the high frequency components run up against the top, which is the folding frequency, they bounce off. They reflect down into the part of the range that I can perceive. And that's what aliasing looks like in a spectrogram. Let's see what that sounds like. <coughs> So that's what you get if you take a sawtooth chirp and sample it at a kind of low cutoff frequency. So we've put it through a filter, but we also have a bunch of aliasing going on and the aliasing is contributing some frequency that are not harmonics. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yes. That is the red alert from the original Star Trek series. And if you remember that, those were made in the, I think 1968, 69. They didn't have a lot of synthesizers to work with, but generating a sawtooth chirp was pretty doable. And so that's pretty much what that special effect is. Because I always think that that's what you want. If you're dealing with a life and death emergency, what you really want going on in the background is for this <laughs> Stay calm, everyone. Don't panic. We're all going to die. <laughs> OK. If you're interested in chirps and spectrograms, there's an excellent 
video game, sort of, that you can play that will play actual chirps, like bird chirps, and will show you the spectrogram of a particular bird, and your job is to match up the spectrogram with the corresponding signal, which is pretty good for starting to develop some intuition for what that correspondence is like. Uh, if you want to, sometime on your own time, not mine, uh, try out Birdsong Hero and see what you think of it. We're gonna take another break in half an hour, so play with Birdsong Hero during that break. Next thing we're gonna do is talk about convolution. And this is the second big part of what we're talking about today. We've talked about spectrums and spectrograms. Now we're gonna start talking about convolution. I'm gonna start with smoothing because this is a kind of convolution that many of you are probably familiar with and then we'll work our way up from there. So one way to smooth out a noisy signal is to compute a moving average. Moving average in, if you look at things like finance, what you'll do is you'll take the last you know, 10 days or the last three quarters of data and compute the average over that period of time. And then you're gonna just shift that period of time. That's why it's called a moving window. You're gonna shift that window over time and compute the moving average. The result that you get looks smoother than what you started with. And this is an example. This is actually the uh, daily close for Facebook uh, for I think the first two or three years after their initial public offering. And you can see the gray line there is the original unsmoothed data and the blue line is a 30 day moving average. So what this looks like in signal processing land is I've got this signal that's a function of time and I've got this window. And in this case the window is I think it's 11 uh, samples long. So what it means, I'm gonna take the first 11 samples, average them together, and then I'm gonna shift the window over by one. I'm gonna take the next 11 overlapping samples. So first it's one through 11, and then two through 12, and then three through 13, and so on. Okay? That operation, where you take that window, you multiply it by the signal, and add it up, then you shift the window over by one, multiply, add, shift, multiply, add, shift. That operation is convolution. Here it is in words. I think in the notebook you'll see the mathematical version. So I'm gonna take my signal, multiply by the window, add up the product, and I'm gonna write that down. That's the first result. Shift the window and repeat. That's how you do a moving window average. Here's one way to do it in Python. This is a wildly inefficient way to do it in Python. But I'm gonna start by initializing smooth. That's the space that the result is gonna go into. I'm gonna create the window, and this is the thing that I'm gonna shift over by one each time. And then I'm gonna loop through my entire signal. Each time through, I'm gonna multiply the rolled window, the window that's been shifted, by the wave, the Y's there are the components of the wave, and then add them up, and then repeat. Rather than get bogged down in the details here, you're gonna see this in the notebook, so let's jump into that. If you open up chapter eight, and run the sections that are called smoothing, and then smoothing sound signals, we'll come back in a couple minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, a couple of things you might want to try out in the notebook. I got a really good question that I wanted to answer up here. So I'm going to create my original signal, and then I'm going to create this window. And the window is 11 samples long, and it's the same height all the way across, and it adds up to one. Uh, the reason I'm doing this line here is to make it add up to one. That's just so it's not making my signal any louder or any quieter. The average amount of energy will be the same. I'm just smoothing it out. So this is a flat line between 0 and 10, so it has 11 elements in it. And then here's what my wave looks like. Now, I'm going to take my window and I'm going to pad it with zeros. I'm adding a whole bunch of zeros to it. So this is the first 11 points are the same as what we were just looking at a minute ago, but now it's got a whole bunch of zeros. And those are there so that the window and the signal are the same length, which is why I can multiply the two of them together. Now, what's going to happen, each time I uh, take one step through, I'm going to shift the window one step to the right. So if you go and you do the whole thing, then the rolled window comes all the way back to the beginning again, and it looks like it never moved. But if you want, change this to like n over 2 so that I only compute the first half of this result. The only reason I'm doing that is so that we can see that the window is halfway along. And if you do a quarter, you'll see that it's a quarter of the way along, and so on. So that's what's going on there. And the result, ah, OK. So in this case, I've only computed one quarter of the result, so it's messed up, so I've got to put it back. But if you put it back, you'll see what the result looks like, which is not wildly different from the original. There's a little bit at the end there that's getting messed up, and that's getting messed up because of the wraparound. This is one of the issues that you run into with convolution. I'm not going to deal with it a lot today. I'm just going to kind of wave my hands and ignore the issue, but dealing with the boundary conditions, the beginning and the end of the signal, is a recurring issue anytime you're working with convolution. But as I said, I'm going to ignore it for now. Now, that thing that we just computed is ridiculously inefficient in Python. Almost any time you find yourself writing a loop in Python to do this kind of numerical computation, it's not going to be fast. Fortunately, the nice people at NumPy have solved this problem for us, which is that they wrote Convolve. And Convolve does what we just did, so the result is very similar, except that it was fast. And the reason it was fast is that it's running inside of a library that I think is probably written in C. So it's going to go a lot faster. Good so far? All right. So what we, what we did there was a moving average. And instead of applying it to the Facebook stock, we applied it to a sawtooth. And what we got is a signal that's a little bit smoother than what the original sawtooth looked like. And if you listen to it, you probably got a sense that, oh, OK, yeah, some of the high frequency components have been uh, erased there. So if we look at the signal, visually, it looks like we've taken some of the corners and smoothed them out just a little bit. So what does that mean about the spectrum? And you can look at what that looks like in the notebook. This is the spectrum of the original in gray and the spectrum of the output after convolution in blue. What does that look like to you? If it's not clear up here, you should be seeing the same thing in your notebook. You might be able to see it more clearly. Are you stretching or bravely volunteering to answer a question? Uh, it's kind of looking like a low pass filter. The low frequency components seem to have got through the smoothing with a little bit. They've been decreased a little bit. The high frequency components have been all but removed. So we now have two views of this operation. When you apply convolution, you can think of it as smoothing if you look at the waveform. And you can think of it as a, a low-pass filter if you look at the spectrum. And those are equivalent ways to think of the same operation. But they're being expressed in the time domain and the frequency domain. What I mean by that, the domain of a function is the x-axis. 
If the x-axis is time, then you are describing a wave as a function of time. If you're in the frequency domain, you are describing a spectrum as a function of frequency. But those are equivalent ways to represent the same information. As we saw, you can take a wave and compute its spectrum. You can take a spectrum and compute its wave. And that gives you the ability to go back and forth between the time domain and the frequency domain. In the same way, you can think of every operation that you perform, like smoothing as an operation. You can think of it as having an effect on the wave, or you can think of it as having an effect on the spectrum. It's just two ways of describing the same thing. So this is my conjecture. We're sort of discovering the convolution theorem by exploring. The conjecture is that when you smooth the signal in the time domain, what you're doing is applying a low-pass filter in the frequency domain. So we might think, okay, well, what kind of filter is it? Can we characterize the filter? One way to think about this is this diagram, which we're going to see over and over, is a way of describing the time domain across the top line and the frequency domain across the bottom. So the left-hand side there, that's my wave, the input wave on top. That's my original sawtooth. In the bottom left, that's the spectrum of the sawtooth. The top right is the output, that's the gray smoothed sawtooth, and the bottom right is the, out, is the spectrum of the output. That's what it looks like after it's been low pass filtered. In the middle, I've got my window, and it's the square window. That's sometimes called a boxcar window, because it looks like a box that's being shifted along a track. So that's my boxcar window. The conjecture is that if we convolve my signal with the window in the time domain, that that's the same as taking the spectrum and doing something with it, applying a filter in the frequency domain. And now I would like to figure out what filter is it. And I'm going to do that by working backwards, which is I'm going to take the output spectrum and divide it by the input spectrum. And that will tell me how much each frequency component has been attenuated by. Okay. So this is maybe we can characterize the filter. We can figure out what we did to the spectrum by comparing the output spectrum and the input spectrum. In code, it looks like this. I'm going to take the output, which is amplitudes 2, and divide it by the input, which is the amplitudes, amps. And then I have to do a little bit of a tweak, which is in the places where I don't have very much energy, this division is going to be really noisy because the denominator is small. So I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to take all the places where the amplitude is low, and I'm just going to clobber that stuff. And what I get is in the frequency domain part of the notebook, which is this. So take a minute, get back into the notebook. I'll come around and answer questions, and then we'll look at the next part. What this figure is showing you is what the filter looks like. It is a low-pass filter. 
because you can see that the low frequencies, everything below about 3,000, is going through the filter mostly unchanged. And all the high frequency components are being cut off. Uh, the vertical axis there is about 20% down to about 10%. So they're being attenuated by a factor of about 10. All right, interesting. It's a low pass filter, but it's a weird low pass filter. It's got all these bouncy parts to it. What's going on there? Well, if we go back to this diagram, we figured out what the filter looks like. It looks like this bouncy gray line. But we still don't know what that function is. Well, why is it bouncy? Why is it like that? Well, one way to read this diagram is, again, to think, well, OK, the top line is the time domain. The bottom line is the frequency domain. I always get from the top to the bottom by computing the discrete Fourier transform. So over there on the left, I take my original wave, I compute its spectrum, and I get the spectrum. Okay. Over here, I take my output and I compute the spectrum of the output. So here's my conjecture, and this is the convolution theorem, is I suspect that that filter is the Fourier transform of my window. And you can test that. That's what's in the notebook. And here's what it looks like. Again, the, the conjecture, the convolution theorem says that when I convolve with a window in the time domain, that corresponds to taking the spectrum and multiplying it by a filter in the frequency domain. And the filter in the frequency domain is the DFT of the window in the time domain. That's the convolution theorem. Here is my graphical proof of the convolution theorem, which is the blue lines there. That's what I computed by taking the ratio of the output and the input. That's, in some sense, the experimental result. And the gray line is the theoretical result. That gray line is the DFT of my window. And they match up pretty well. So that now gives me this way of representing what we've learned. So graphically, what it means is that I can do convolution in the time domain. That's the top row. Or I can do multiplication in the frequency domain. That's the bottom row. And they work out the same way. And I should explain the notation there. The star is convolution. And the circle is just plain old element-wise multiplication. I'm taking each frequency component and multiplying by the corresponding component in the filter. Uh, if you speak math, that's the Hadamard product of those two vectors. Okay. So this says that convolution in the time domain corresponds to element-wise multiplication in the frequency domain. One way to think about this graphically is if you want to compute the lower right-hand corner, there are now two ways to do it. One way is I can do the convolution first and then the DFT. That's the orange path. That says take the wave, convolve with the window, and then compute the DFT. Or I can take the green path. The green path says, take the DFT of the wave, take the DFT of the window, and then just do multiplication. The convolution theorem is telling me that those two paths are equal. In either case, I get the spectrum of the output. And that is the one slide version of the convolution theorem. Good? Questions? Yeah. How would you actually compute the DFT of the window? How would you compute the DFT of the window? In the convolution, the window is moving. Yes, good question. The window is moving. So how do I compute its DFT? I can just take a static view of that window. It actually doesn't matter where in time it is, because when I shift it in time, that's a phase offset. So it will show up in the phase part of the DFT, but here I'm just showing the amplitudes. Good. Great question. That's my next slide. <laughs> nice. Question was, is one of these more computationally efficient than the other? 
And the answer is yes, that the orange line, computing convolution in the time domain, is a quadratic operation. It's proportional to n squared, where n is the size of the array. Computing the Fourier transform, the, the FFT, and this is why the FFT is such an important algorithm, takes n log n time. n log n is better than quadratic, and even doing two of them is still better than quadratic, and even doing two of them and then doing element-wise multiplication, because that's just linear, is still better than quadratic. So even though the green line seems like it's more operations, it is computationally more efficient. And this is, in fact, a nice way to compute convolutions, which is to do everything in the frequency domain. All right. We will take our second, oh, we're running just a little late. Let's take our second break now, and we'll come back in 10 minutes, which is going to be 3.40.
Okay, we are back. What have we learned? All right, we learned that when you do convolution in the time domain, it corresponds to multiplication by a filter in the frequency domain. And that filter is the Fourier transform of the window. Good. The other thing that we learned is that a boxcar window, which is a smoothing window, corresponds to a low-pass filter. But it's not a very good low-pass filter. Because what you want in a low-pass filter is ideally everything below the cutoff frequency should go through the filter totally unchanged. And everything above the cutoff frequency should get removed completely. But that's not what we're getting. We're getting these weird bouncy things where some of my high frequency components are getting totally eliminated, but some of them are still there. They're reduced by a factor of 10, but that's not good enough. I want to get rid of those bouncy things. So the question is, how do I design a better window in the time domain to correspond to a better filter in the frequency domain? And my conjecture is that a Gaussian window might help. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sharp edges of my boxcar window and I'm going to round them off. And I'm going to make a nice smooth window in the time domain. And the reason is because a smooth window in the time domain will correspond to a sharper cutoff in the frequency domain. If you go back into chapter 8 and go down to the section that says Gaussian window, there's an interactive widget there that you can play around with to explore what I just said. Play with it, and I'll show you some results in a minute. 
Okay, I want to play around with this a little bit. So the two parameters here, uh, standard deviation, STD, is the width of this Gaussian curve. So this is, if you're familiar with a bell curve or a normal distribution, this is mathematically the same as that. It's not a probability distribution. So if you're thinking about that, that's just confusing. But this is the window that I'm going to use. Instead of the boxcar, which ju just goes from 0 to 1 instantly, so it's got that discontinuity, this is nice and smooth. No discontinuities. It ramps up, curves over the top, and ramps back down. If you take the standard deviation and make it smaller, then what you're doing to the window is you're making the window narrower and narrower, which means that you're adding up fewer elements from the wave, which means that you're doing less and less smoothing, which means that you are making the cutoff of the filter higher and higher. So as I make standard deviation go down, the window on the left is getting narrower, and the cutoff frequency on the right is shifting off to the right. Eventually, I get down to the point where my standard deviation is really small, which means my window is really small, which means I'm not doing any smoothing, which means that my filter is basically doing nothing. Okay. Go the other direction, start cranking up the standard deviation. The window is getting wider, which means that I'm adding up more elements, which means that I'm doing more smoothing, which corresponds in the frequency domain to a lower cutoff. But then I start to run into something funny. As I make the standard de deviation bigger and bigger, my cutoff is getting lower and lower, but the quality of my filter is starting to get bad. And I can see that in two ways. When I look at the spectrum on the right, I can see that those bouncy high frequency components are coming back. I don't like those, because that, that means that I'm not attenuating the high frequencies by as much as I wanted to. The other thing you can see and on the left is that my window is getting worse and worse. Because it's not a smooth Gaussian curve anymore. It's a Gaussian curve that's getting cut off at the edges. And those edges are creating sharp discontinuities. Sharp discontinuity in the time domain is corresponding to high frequency components in the frequency domain. That's where those bouncy things are coming from. One way to get rid of them is by making the window bigger so that I get a bigger slice of the Gaussian. As I make this bigger, I'm, my window is now a better and better approximation of a Gaussian. And my filter is getting to be a better and better filter because those high frequency bouncy components are going away. How's that? Making sense? All right. So part of what we learned there is that if you have a wider window in the time domain, you are adding up more components. You're adding up more samples, I should say which means that you're applying more smoothing, and more smoothing means a lower cutoff frequency for your low-pass filter. But the other thing that we saw is if the standard deviation is really wide, which means that your bell curve is really wide, but your value of m is too small, then you're taking your nice smooth Gaussian, you're cutting off the edges, and those sharp edges that you've introduced cause the extra frequency components to come back. So that is the second. Yes, question? Is there a ratio of these two things that makes it work? One way to think about it is that you need m to be big enough that the edges of your window are pretty close to 0. It's a little bit like making pie, which is that you want the crust. You can have the crust kind of piled up on the middle of the pie, but when it comes down to the edge of the pie, you need to make a good seal at the beginning and the end. In the case of pie, that means that you don't have fruit that comes spilling out and it falls onto the bottom of the oven and burns and makes smoke. In the case of a filter, what it means is that you've crimped down the edges of your filter so that you don't have discontinuities, because discontinuities is bad. A little bit of a stretch for a metaphor, but 
Hopefully that makes sense. All right. We've got the discrete Fourier transform. We've got the convolution theorem. The third piece that I mentioned all the way at the beginning was LTI theory, linear time invariant theory. To understand LTI, we have to introduce the idea of what a system is. A system is anything that takes a signal as an input and produces a signal as an output. So you can think of this as practically any electronic component. You can put a time varying signal in, you get a time varying signal out. It's true of mechanical systems too, which is that you can put a vibration in on one end of a mechanical structure and you, the other end will vibrate as well. You can think of it as sound, like in a room. So the sound that's leaving my, my mouth is, well, it's going through a microphone, but it's coming from speakers and it's going to your ear. So the room is behaving like a system that takes input from me and you hear the output on your end. To say that a system is LTI means that it has two properties. It has to be time invariant, that's the TI, and linear. Let me do time invariant first. Time invariant means that the system has the same effect on the same signal regardless of the time of day. An LTI system in some sense has no clock. It has no sense of things that change over time other than the signal. So mathematically what that means is if input one produces output one today, then it will produce the same output given the same input tomorrow and until the end of time. Okay, so for the system to be time invariant means same input, same output. To say that the system is linear means that if I put two signals in separately or if I put them in together, the effect is the same. A little bit more rigorously what that means is if I've got one input that produces one output, so input one produces output one, input two produces output two, if I take the inputs and add them together, the output of the system will be the sum of the outputs. That's what it means to say that it's linear. By and large, this is what you expect from audio equipment and what you expect from the acoustics of a room. That if you have two people talking at the same time, what you hear is the sum of the two inputs. And in fact, it is pretty much true that acoustics are LTI that most rooms are pretty well modeled by an LTI system. It's not, nothing in the real world is ever, strictly speaking, exactly mathematically true, but by and large, acoustics is pretty much LTI. So one way to think about it that I defined LTI, I want to say a little bit about, okay, so what does that mean? What are the consequences of that definition? One way to think about it is what could a room do to a sound? Well, one thing that it can do is it can introduce a delay. So there can be a time delay between when the input goes in and when the output comes out. It can cause an echo. So what you're actually hearing right now is not the signal that I'm generating. You are hearing many, many copies of the signal that I'm generating that are delayed by different amounts. Because what you're hearing is partly the straight line between me and you, but it's also bouncing off walls. And you can think of every possible path between me and you is a different delay. So you're hearing many, many delayed copies. And some of them are louder than others. Because the longer the path, the less uh, amplitude there is when it finally gets to you. So that's what an acoustic system can do. Some of the things that it can't do by and large, if you're just talking about a room, which is a passive system, it can't output any more energy than is going in. So there's no way that what you're hearing is louder than what I'm producing. Well, other than the fact that we have an amplifier, so that is messing up my example. But normally, in a room that doesn't have amplifiers in it, the total energy has to be conserved. The other thing, an LTI system can't move energy from one frequency to another. So if I were up here and I had a tuning fork and I played precisely 440 hertz, you might hear it loud, you might hear it quiet, you might hear it delayed, you might hear many delayed copies, but you will never hear anything other than 440 hertz. Okay? And I use a tuning fork because that produces a pretty pure sinusoid 
without any other frequency components. All right, so you can't move energy around. This, the mechanical system I have there, that's from a patent. That is a mechanical frequency doubler. That is an example of a mechanical system where if you put a vibration into it at 440 hertz, it will output a vibration at 880 hertz. It's not easy to design one of those, which is why it has a patent, but that would be an example of a system that is not LTI, because it violates exactly this, this uh, restriction. However, if the system is LTI, what that means is that I can describe the room acoustically. I can summarize its acoustic properties just by telling you what it does to each frequency component. In other words, if I know for this room, I know that it will attenuate different frequencies by different amounts. If I can figure out how much it attenuates each frequency, then I know everything about the room that I need to know. And that's what I mean. When I say characterize a system, what I mean is I know what it does to every possible frequency component. So there are a couple of ways that I could do this. And one of them, let's say that I wanted to go into a famous building like a cathedral, and I wanted to characterize its acoustic performance. Because people say, oh, this is such a great space for music. All right, I want to reproduce that. So how could I measure the acoustic response of a space? Well, one possibility is I could play one frequency at a time. And you could think of it like, you know, almost like a piano. If you had a piano that just produces one pure tone at a time, I would just play each note on the piano, and I would record the output, and then I would have a spectrum that tells me for every frequency how, how did it get through the system. What was the output for each input? I could play one note at a time, or I could sweep through a range of frequencies. I could play like a chirp. And that was part of the reason that I wanted to show chirps earlier, is that that's another way to characterize a system, is just do a frequency sweep. If you've done some electrical engineering, you have probably done this, which is one of the ways to characterize an electronic circuit, is to sweep through a range of frequencies and measure the outputs. But the other possibility is, if the system is linear, then that means I don't have to put the frequency components in one at a time. I can add them all up. I can input all the frequencies at the same time, and the output will be the same as if I did them all individually and then added them up. So the next question then is, if I want to input all the frequencies at the same time, what should I input into the system? What does a signal look like that contains all frequencies? Well, now you're getting ahead of things. <laughs> now, so one, white noise is one possibility. White noise, on average, has the same amount of energy at all frequencies. And in fact, white noise is one of the ways to characterize uh, a, a room. But you might have to run the white noise for a long time, because it's only true on average. It's not true at every, in any particular chunk. Well, if I'm trying to figure out what a wave looks like, if I know what the spectrum looks like, I can work backwards. So this is the spectrum I want. This is the spectrum that contains equal energy at all frequencies. Well, if I give me a wave, I know how to get the corresponding spectrum. Well, you give me a wave, sorry, you give me a spectrum, I know how to get the corresponding wave. I just compute the inverse discrete Fourier transform, and that's what I get. So on the left is the spectrum, equal power at all frequencies. On the right is the wave, and it is a spike. It is zero everywhere, and then one or some arbitrary value at one location. It is as close as we can get mathematically to a delta function. So step function is really close. Step function is the integral of this, which is also good. But this is the uh, input that has all the frequency components. That thing is called an impulse, something that's 0 and then jumps to a value and then jumps right back down. That's the impulse. So what I'm going to do to characterize a room is put into it an impulse and then record what the output is. The output is called the impulse response. And then I'm going to take that impulse response and compute its DFT, 
The DFT of that is called the transfer function for a reason I'm going to explain in just a second. So jump into chapter 10. The first two sections just kind of make a quick pass through that. The section I want to draw your attention to is the section that's marked acoustic impulse response. 
Okay, so in the previous section, we just figured out that an impulse, which is a wave that is zero everywhere and one at a particular very short period of time, is a signal that contains all the frequencies at once. So characterize a room by putting an impulse into it. Well, how do you generate an impulse? One way to do it is to pop a balloon. This is one of the things that people actually do when they want to characterize a room. But the other is any very sudden loud noise is at least an approximation of an impulse. Hand claps and gunshots are the other. And actually gunshots are at least firing a starter pistol is one of the ways that people actually characterize rooms. So here's what I did. I, I went back to freesound.org, which again is this great resource. And they have lots of recordings of gunshots because this is what acoustic engineers do. And this is what it sounds like. If you fire a gun in some particular room, here's what it sounds like. So that is the impulse response. I'm assuming that the gunshot itself was like a mathematical impulse. But what you hear is not just a single sharp crack, but lots of delayed attenuated copies. You can think of this as being the sum of the gunshot plus lots and lots of echoes. Okay? And you can kind of see that visually when you look at the waveform. You can think of this as being a really sharp peak at the shortest path between the microphone and the gun, and lots and lots of little peaks for all the other paths between the microphone and the gun. Now, if we compute the spectrum of the impulse response, that's telling me if I put all the frequencies in, this is what I get out. So this is telling me that this room will, will take low frequencies and let them go through mostly unchanged. It'll take high frequencies and cut them off to varying degrees. And the exact shape of this curve is telling me what the room does to every frequency. It's also telling me how much of a delay the room imposes on all the frequencies because that's encoded in the phase information. I'm not showing it because graphically it doesn't mean very much, but this is a case where the phase does matter. If you're looking at the transfer function, we care about phase because that's telling me how much each frequency component is being delayed by. And now if you shuffle the phases like we did with that other example, that will mess things up. Okay, so we're not gonna do it. But that's the transfer function. This is the transfer function on a log-log scale, which sometimes makes the structure of it a little bit easier to see. Now, I'm going to take my violin recording again, and I'm going to I'll play that just to remind you what it sounds like. And I can compute the Fourier transform of the input. So this is the spectrum of the violin. Now, there are two ways to figure out how this room is going to behave. One way is convolution in the time domain. So I'm going to take, oh, sorry, no, this is plain old multiplication. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do this in the frequency domain. So I'm going to take the spectrum, which is the spectrum of the input. I'm going to take the transfer function, which is the spectrum of the impulse response. Multiply them together element-wise. That'll give me the spectrum of the output. And then the make wave operation is the inverse DFT. I'm going to go over this again in a second, so don't panic. This is what the output looks like. Uh, there's the output. And here's what it sounds like. Two things you might notice there. One is there's a weird little blurp at the beginning. That's being wrapped around from the end. That's one of those boundary conditions that I mentioned that's always kind of a pain when you're doing stuff like this. There are ways to work around that, but I'm not going to get into that level of detail right now. But the other is you can kind of get a sense of what that violin sounds like when it's being played in a different room. You can almost get a sense of what the room looks like, which is it sounds kind of echoey, and it sounds kind of big. It sounds like a big echoey room. In fact, it kind of sounds like a firing range. 
which is, I suspect, where that gunshot was recorded. I don't know that for sure, but that's what, at least what it sounds like to me. So there are two ways to think about what we just did and kind of two sets of vocabulary that go together. I took a wave, which is the violin. So the top left there is the violin, and the middle is the impulse response. That's what the gunshot sounded like. That's what the room, re that was the response of the room to an impulse input. When you convolve the two of them together, you get the thing in the upper right, which is that nice echoey version of the violin that we just heard. So one way to think about what we did is convolution in the time domain. The other way to think about what we did was we took the spectrum of the violin recording and we applied a filter to it. That filter is the DFT of the impulse response. It is the system characterization that tells me what effect that room has on each frequency, both in terms of amplitude and phase. And the result is the spectrum of the output, the spectrum of the violin if it had been played in the room where the gunshot was recorded. And just to substitute in some vocabulary, this is when we were talking about the convolution theorem, we talked about a window and its corresponding filter. In the context of this system characterization, the window now is the impulse response, and its spectrum is the transfer function. The reason it's called a transfer function is that it tells you how the system behaves. It tells you how the system transfers the input into the output. And this is the graphical representation of what we just did. Questions? Okay. We have one more section of the notebook. If you want to jump back in, run the convolution section. And I think that's the last section we're going to do of the notebook. When you run this cell, it will take a long time because it's a wildly inefficient way to do things. 
Okay, let me talk through the example that you're working through here. So I said before that an acoustic system, a room, is producing lots of shifted scaled copies of the input. So again, the sound that's coming out of my mouth is getting to you by many different paths, and each of those paths is shifting the input, which means that there's a delay between when it leaves my mouth and when it gets to your ears, and it's also scaling it, which means that it's getting louder or, uh, well, not louder, it is being attenuated by different degrees, depending on which path it took. So I've got a function here called shifted scaled that just takes an input, delays it by a certain amount of time, and scales it by a certain factor. Just to show you how it works, I did one version that just takes the input, which is the gunshot, and makes just two copies. Uh, one loud one, and then one quiet one. So this is like firing a gun in a canyon, where you hear the initial shot directly, and then it bounces off the far end of the canyon, and it comes back to you, and sure enough, this sounds like an echo. So you distinctly hear two successive shots. And that's, an echo, in some sense, is a weird phenomenon to us. Part of the reason that it's fun to go to a canyon and yell and hear the echo come back is that that's not how we normally hear sound. Normally, if you hear shifted scaled copies of the same thing, your brain combines them into one thing. You don't actually realize that this is happening. But it's true. If you hear two sounds in rapid succession, your brain steps in and says, oh no, that wasn't really two sounds. That was re really one sound and an echo. And I don't want you to get confused. So I'm going to make it seem to you like that was just one sound. Your brain is constantly deceiving you like that. So that was part one. One way to see that that's true is that if you hear things like half a second apart, you clearly identify them as two different sounds. But if I play a gunshot 220 times per second, you don't hear bang, 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 bang. You hear something that sounds like a tone at 220 hertz. That was a 220 gun salute played with a spacing between guns of a few milliseconds. Okay. So now we can take the same thing for an arbitrary input signal, like a sine wave, and make lots and lots of shifted, scaled copies of the sine wave. See, I think I've actually got myself a little confused about this example. What are we doing here? So I'm starting with a sawtooth. And then I'm taking my impulse response. Right. Taking my impulse response, I'm making lots and lots of copies of the gunshot. And I'm using the sawtooth con to control for each copy how big it is. So the previous version, the copies were all the same size. Now the copies are going to follow the contour of a sawtooth, and this is what the output looks like, and this is what it sounds like. So that is a simulation of the sawtooth if it was played in the room where the gunshot was recorded. And it sounds to me a little bit like it's in a garage. It kind of sounds like a car horn being played in an echoey garage. And we can see the spectrum before and after. And again, it's behaving like a low-pass filter as far as the amplitudes are concerned. But it's also got this phase information that I'm not showing graphically. And that's where the echoes come from. The echoes come from the phase. So what I just did, creating lots of shifted scaled copies and adding them up, that's what convolution is. Mathematically, it is equivalent to say, I'm applying a filter in the frequency domain, or I'm making lots and lots of shifted scaled copies in the time domain. Mathematically, that's what convolution is, and we can see that by applying the convolution operator and getting pretty much the same output. Doing the same thing with the violin. 
we get what the violin would have sounded like if it was played in the room where the gunshot was recorded. Making sense? Questions? All right. So we just got two views of the same thing. One of them in the time domain, convolution is like adding up shifted scaled copies of things. And then our ear is doing some work to put that stuff together for us. So instead of sounding like many, many impulse responses, it sounds like the input played in the room where the gunshot was fired. Because one way to think about the input is that the input is a sequence of impulses. Remember that what a wave is is a bunch of samples at discrete points in time. You can think of each of those samples as being an impulse. And each of those impulses is being fired like a gunshot, one after another. Some of them are louder than others, and each of them is delayed from its predecessor. And then the output is the sum of many shifted scaled copies. So I hope that that's one helpful idea. If you remember one thing, you should think, every time you hear the word convolution, you should think, I'm adding up lots of shifted scaled copies of the input. If you think about convolution that way, it makes sense. This is the output, that's what that violin looks like. And that is the third piece of what we needed. So we started out with this example where I could simulate the effect of a violin being played in a room that I had characterized by using an impulse, converting its impulse response. And the three pieces that we needed to make sense of that were the discrete Fourier transform, which is how we get back and forth between the time domain and the frequency domain. We used the convolution theorem, which says that anything I do in the time domain corresponds to an operation in the frequency domain. In other words, I can think of it as taking a signal, breaking it up into its frequency components, applying an operation to each of those frequency components, and then adding them up again. That's the convolution theorem. And then the third is linear time invariant theory that says that if I've got a room or any other system, as long as it obeys the rules, the LTI rules, then all I need to know is the impulse response, and I know everything I need to know about the room. All right. We did a lot, and we did it really fast. I hope it makes sense. I hope you're going to leave with a big picture of what's going on. I also hope that you'll be interested in learning more about it. Obviously, I'm going to recommend one resource, which is ThinkDSP. Uh, you have basically gone through the ten, five out of the 10 chapters of ThinkDSP. So if you want the other five chapters, again, you can uh, grab a copy. It's uh, sold by O'Reilly, but also electronic versions are free from uh, Green Tea Press. So check that out. It's under a Creative Commons license in part because I get a lot of feedback from readers that helps me improve the book, sometimes finding errors or sometimes just telling me, this is the point where I got confused. Can you explain that better? So if you do get a chance to work through it, let me know what works for you. Let me know if there are places that you think I can improve. Uh, lastly, that is four ways to get in touch with me. So if you want to ask any questions or follow up. And then the last thing, we have a survey that is uh, your chance to give us some feedback on the tutorial. And as you can see, I was supposed to add that link. I think you might get it by email. Um, but I think I can also probably find it, and I'll put it up here in just a second. But let me take a couple of minutes to uh, uh, take questions if you have any, and then we will break up anything you want to ask about. Yes, sir. Good. Right, that's a great question. The question is, does the impulse response contain the initial bang plus other things, or is it just the other things? It's really just the other things. The bang itself is almost unobservable. Unless, like, even if you put a microphone right next to the gun, there's still some distance there. There's still some air between the gun and the microphone, and that's still like a system. So the initial impulse is unobservable. You really only can ever observe the output of a system, never really the input. 
I didn't expect it to get so philosophical, but it kind of does. Yeah. Yes, let me try to paraphrase that. What you said is, you know, anything in the real world, like a gun or a room or anything like that, we never have a pure mathematical description of that thing. It's always, you know, real world messiness. But, but it sounds like you're asking, like, could I engineer a room that is as close as possible to recording a real impulse? Like a perfect gun and a room that has no echoes at all, so it's totally dead. In fact, if you, if you look on YouTube, there's a video about a dead room that somebody built exactly to do these kinds of experiments. And it's basically a wire mesh cage completely surrounded by styrofoam, not styrofoam, but like acoustic foam that is intended to be soft and dead and produce no echoes. Um, so yes, as an engineering exercise, you can get closer and closer to recording a pure impulse. But then you said something interesting, which is, can you hear a pure impulse? Well, the ear is also a system. So. The, ear is, the ear is also a system, right. I mean, what's, what is actually happening with a pure impulse is just that the air pressure is suddenly changing from one level of pressure to another. And I don't know it, if. It will generate, it will generate the harmonics, so the pressure it, cannot just right. increase in a, and also, why do different guns in the same room have a different pitch? So the question is, why would different guns in the same room have a different sound? And yeah, that's getting into some of the mechanical vibration of the actual gun, and also the resonance of the barrel and all that. Yep. So Good. So yeah. <laughs> It would probably be close. The question is, if you, if you do different things to try to approximate an impulse, so uh, gun, uh, gunshots and hand claps and balloon pops, you're gonna, the impulse response will look somewhat different, but probably similar enough that you wouldn't hear the difference between those violin simulations. Good. Yes? Would it be a quick square wave? Yeah, it wouldn't be square, because squares are hard to do in reality. And now you've got me thinking, I, I, the, probably the best approximation would be a giant speaker cone that's driven by an extremely strong linear inductor that would try to just drive the cone as quickly as possible out and back. I think that's the best mechanical system to produce the closest thing to a sound impulse. I don't know, I'm making this up. <laughs> yes. Ah, okay, good question. Let me see if I can paraphrase it. So we've been talking about recording an impulse response. What we haven't talked about is now taking that recording and sampling it. And you're asking what effect the sampling rate will have when you try to record the impulse response. The answer is, yeah, you're going to have to worry about the cutoff frequency and aliasing, which is the sample rate will determine the highest frequency that you can characterize. So if the room does something different to higher frequencies, you won't know about it after doing sampling. And even worse than that, if the, the impulse response contains many, many high frequency components, when you sample, they're going to get aliased back into the range and they're going to mess up your measurements. So in practice, when people take uh, a recording and then sample it, it's a really good idea to apply a low pass filter before sampling. So an analog low pass filter to make sure that you get rid of any frequency components that are above the cutoff of your sampling so that at least they don't get aliased. It's not ideal that they get dropped, 
but dropped is better than aliased. Yeah. Yes, good question. So the question is, uh, do I need the convolution theorem to do this, or could I, I mean, it, it's uh, um, computationally faster, but could I do it the slow way? And yes, in fact, the last example that we looked at in the notebook was doing it the slow way. And yes, they are equivalent, it's just one of them is faster than the other. In some ways, if you like, what's actually going on in the room is the slow way. Physics is doing it the hard way because it is making shifted scaled copies. Anything else? Yes. Um, when you were saying about applying low pass filter before uh, doing the shifted scale, mm -hmm. that would have to be an analog low pass filter, right? Correct. No, that's good. You, you said it again, which is good. Yeah, if you're using a low pass filter before sampling, it has to be an analog low pass filter. Uh, and, you, and you would tune it to whatever you know the sampling rate is going to be. Correct. Once you've done the sampling, the aliasing has already happened and there's no way to undo it. Good. All right, well, let me stop there. Thank you all very much. This has been great.